Okay, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Mikolai Moze. I work at Poznan University of Technology and the Institute of Computing Science. I work in machine learning. Uh, and this is my role, uh, the role of, of, of me and my colleagues in this project. Uh, when asked to present during the seminar, I was thinking about what would be the most, because I knew that I would be uh, in the company of ethicists, I would be the only one not understanding what they're talking about. Um, so I've decided to yeah, to, to at least contribute to the discussion and maybe to demystify machine learning a little bit because uh, people tend to use this phrase machine learning, artificial intelligence uh, so vaguely, but um, it's not that complex and it's not that complicated. Uh, well, the engineers can do it, so how hot can it be? Uh, so this will be my presentation. I will look at machine learning and what can go wrong when doing research and learning and applying uh, models uh, learned or trained on uh, data uh, mostly harvested from, from the web, from open repositories, from sources such as Twitter. Uh, and we'll, in particular, we will look at what is what could go wrong. Now, why do we uh, why is there so so much stress on artificial intelligence or on machine learning? Now, if you think about computer science as it is or as it has been for the last 50 years, this is basically it. You take the data, you apply some kind of an algorithm to the data and you get the results. And whether you are just typing something in your word processor, whether you are computing some equations in your spreadsheet, whether you're browsing in your browser through the internet, this is all the time what you do, right? You have the data either manually created by you or taken from somewhere, you apply an algorithm and an algorithm is just a well-defined finite set of steps that uh, bring you to, uh, to a desired goal and you, you obtain the results, right? Uh, so the algorithm here had to be written from scratch, had to be programmed. Some, someone had to write down the code that transforms and, and processes the data to produce the result. And this is when machine learning comes in, because machine learning is indeed a revolution when it comes to ICT. Because in machine learning, this is what we do. We take the data, we show the expected results, and the algorithm is the result of what we do. So the method, the steps required to get from data to results is the result of computation itself. And that's why we no longer have to code things uh, manually. We don't have to program them. Uh, they program themselves, right? Uh, but, and that's why those methods are so data greedy. The more data you present and the more expected results you present to a machine learning model, the better the model becomes and the more accurate the, uh, the modeling of the reality or the representation of reality becomes. So this is, I understand that this is quite vague, so let's go into details and let's do some live programming. Consider a very simple example. Uh, if you were to, to teach a child to solve this kind of problem, right? given three numbers, produce the results. So a child would have to understand the concept of addition and the concept of multiplication, and maybe also the concept of which, um, uh, which formulas or which operations should be performed first and which should be performed later on. But basically, you would assume some kind of intelligence, some kind of understanding. And this is absolutely not what artificial intelligence does. Remember that we, instead of trying to encode the algorithm of solving the problem, we are, trying, we are trying to derive this algorithm by just throwing lots and lots and lots of data onto the machine learning algorithm. And that's exactly how we will solve this problem. We will just create thousands of triplets, just showing three numbers and the result of this computation to a machine. And we will hope that the machine learns how to add and to multiply. So. Uh, now for coding. Uh, this is the only thing that I will do. I will create, I will uh, randomly select integers, so uh, integer numbers from one to, and I will put some caps on, not to build, uh, so not to build uh, too large numbers. And the result will be 
sum up the first two numbers and multiply by the third number. And this will be the result. So this will be the input and this will be the result. So let's execute this one. And yeah, we are now creating 10,000 examples. Each example consists of 10 numbers and I have limited the size of or the, the yeah, the, I've put a cap on numbers uh, on, on integers that we select to be just from zero to 10, just for the sake of simplicity. So uh, let's see how, uh, sorry, blah, blah, blah. yeah, I run it. So this is exactly it, right? This is just the head of this data frame. Uh, but as you can see, nine plus three is 12 times eight, it's 96. Uh, 8 plus 4 is 12 times 4, 48, and so on, so on. And I've, um, I have randomly created 10,000 of such examples. And now I will just present those examples. I will keep presenting those examples to a simple neural network. So let's define the simple neural network. Um, and we will run this network for 10 epochs. An epoch is a full scan through the data set. So 10 times the data set will be read by the network and the network will try to learn how to add and to multiply, uh, mind you, without ever uh, um, explaining what an addition or multiplication is. So this is our uh, neural network. It consists of three layers. And here is the training. So just give it a second. Uh, what you are seeing there is a loss function. The loss function measures the, the steps of learning. So the, the smaller the loss, the better the learning. So you can see that we started with some random uh, knowledge or no knowledge at all. And by going through these examples, uh, you see that it goes down, goes down, goes down, goes down. Uh, well, we could continue the learning and probably would go to, to much better results, but this should be enough. Let's see the results. This is the test. So this is the set of examples that the network has not seen before. And we will just show those three numbers, ask the network to provide the results, and we will compare them to expected results. So what we expect to see. So let's do exactly this. And this is our network's response. So sometimes it goes awry. And here is a huge uh, error. Uh, we've expected 24, but yeah, the network is totally mistaken. It, it gives you a 21. But other than that, doesn't look so bad, right? So uh, after a very very short time, it, it learned to uh, it learned to add. Maybe uh, I'll repeat this step. The only thing I will change is I will give it uh, a little bit more time to learn. So instead of this, let's say let's give it twice as much time. Okay, and now let's generate a new test set and well, more or less, there is a little bit of error, but still uh, we have some uh, some knowledge. And the subject that interests us the most in the context of this seminar is the bias. So what happens if the training data gets corrupted in some way? And that's exactly what we will do here. So again, I'll go back to the shorter uh, learning so number of epochs, but now in each turn, I will change the expected results. The, uh, this array basically contains the expected values. This is in the training. This is the column that, that presented the result. So what I will do now is in every 100 elements, so we have 10,000 examples, I will modify every hundredth example. So I'll just modify 1% of the examples. And instead of having a real number there, I will just say zero. So 1% of data will be slightly corrupted, right? Instead of containing the true value, it will contain a zero. So you can already see that the training is much worse. 
right? The loss function does not go down, and this is, mind you, just a 1% of little error. And let's see our network. Yeah, and the network starts making much larger uh, errors, and especially it starts veering into the negatives, which it shouldn't because uh, we are adding and multiplying only uh, positive integers, and so it, it should never produce a negative integer, but it did. What will happen if we do a much more severe uh, modification? So what happens if I input there uh, just 1% of examples, uh, something very, very large. So it's a clear measurement error, right? So let's see what happens now. And just by looking at the loss function now, you can clearly in, uh, expect what will happen when I try to apply this model now to the data. So these are the values that we are expecting. So uh, roughly 60, 25, 28, 22, and so on. And here are the responses. The model goes completely nuts. And this is by just modifying a 1% of the data. Probably we could try to do this with one tenth of a percent and still the network would go crazy. Uh, for a very, very simple task, right? For just learning how to add and multiply numbers. And uh, this is uh, nothing in compared to the complexity of the task of um, doing the uh, facial recognition or trying to model the language or trying to model the, the physicality of the world and so on and so forth. So yeah, there you have it, the bias in machine learning training, explained as simple as, as simply as, as possible. So what is this bias? Basically, by the term bias, we mean any type of a systemic distortion of the data. Uh, we use the data in machine learning in three different ways. We use it for training the models. We use it for testing the models. So during the model training, we come up with a model. Uh, this model can have several hyperparameters, and we're trying to pick the best hyperparameters, the depth of a neural network, the architecture of individual cells in, in the neural network, the loss function being applied to the neural network. And all these are called hyperparameters. And we can use test sets just to optimize the hyperparameters. And we also need some separate uh, data set for validation. So the data that have never ever been used during the training, and this is the data that we just test the final model on just to get a glimpse of how this model will work in real life, in, in, in the wild, in production, as we say, right? And the bias, so this distortion of the data can be caused by many different, uh, many different uh, sources. Um, algorithm bias, this is something quite rare uh, because you'd have to believe that the programmers themselves want to introduce a bias into the code. Uh, this is possible, of course, you can think of uh, uh, industrial espionage, um, you can think of just someone being a jerk. Uh, yeah, sure, this is not impossible, but given all the pipelines of, of software production and all the good habits and, and best practices of software production and code reviews and so on and so forth, this is not very, very likely. Sample bias. Well, this is a very, very uh, significant source of, of bias. Uh, the data may be skewed by the method of capturing. You can rely on historical data. And this historical data, well, it has its own problems due to the fact that they reflect the world as it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. And in many respects, that was not the optimal world that you might want to train your data on. This may be just a stupid way of selecting the data. This may be the survival bias, right? Uh, you only see the things that survived, and these are these are the only things that you can sample. For instance, uh, if you were to build a model of how well the company will perform in a in a five years time, and you are taking the uh, for instance the uh, the information from the from the market from the last ten years most probably you will not see all the hundreds of companies that have failed and, and ceased to exist 
over those 10 years. You will just see those that survived. So they will be the best on the market. And you will be training your data on a skewed data set because it will just show you who has survived and not uh, it will not show you the characteristics uh, of all those companies that went down during, for instance, a sudden crisis. Um, this can be as dumb as um, one of the American cities uh, which came up with the idea of um, of creating a simple application for uh, for an iPhone, where it would use the gyroscope in the in the um, uh, in the phone to discover the moment that the the phone was moving in a car, and it would monitor the trembles. So whenever a sudden drop or something would appear, then the the application would assume that there is a pothole, right? And th that's why the car has suddenly. Uh, made a movement or something, and the, it would report the geolocation of the potential pothole to the to the city uh, services. Yeah, the problem was that they've developed this only for iPhones, and there is a clear correlation between your income and, by extension, to your ethnicity, uh, to the phone you have. And the city was uh, fixing the potholes, but in predominantly in in white neighborhoods, right? Um, that could also be the algorithm bias uh, here. And the measurement bias, right? Some kind of mechanical error, faulty sensor that, that was, or maybe if the data is being uh, collected by individuals, they bring their own assumptions, their own subjective judgments into the way they record the data, right? So uh, all of them, uh, all of that can be the source of, the source of, uh, uh, of bias. Um, here is an, famous example of very, very biased system. Uh, it was the model which tries to, uh, and I'm afraid that it is being used. Um, it tries to predict the probability that a person who is uh, seeking for an early release from prison will reoffend. And it's basically, uh, there was a very, very famous uh, study made in 2016, which looked at, at uh, the, so the problem with this model was that when it was right, it was really right, and it was very, very correct. So the precision was high of the model, right? Whenever it made a correct prediction, the prediction, prediction was very precise. But when it made an error, uh, a false positive, it made different false positives um, between different ethnicities, right? So uh, for black defendants, it it computed a much, much higher risk of recidivism than actually uh, presented in, in the real data. And uh, exactly the same thing happened for white defendants who were predicted to pose a lower risk of recidivism than they really did, uh, which came from, from the records, right? Uh, and it was kind of hard to find because the uh, this bias was present, but only in a part of the model, not in the part of the model when the model was correct, because then it made exactly the same uh, or exactly precise uh, predictions for uh, white and black defendants. The difference was in other prediction, right? So uh, kind of uh, hard to uh, hard to find uh, and ha hard to diagnose uh, problem. Um, this is a beautiful example uh, and very relevant to Twitter. Uh, in two th uh, 2018, Microsoft uh, developed an artificial bot, Microsoft Tay. It was called Tay AI. Um, and basically, they've created a bot, uh, a Twitter bot, and they said it will learn from the conversation uh, with real people. So the bot had a language model. It could understand the conversations. It would learn from conversations, uh, and they've just given it to, to the whole uh, Twitter community to talk and have meaningful conversations. And at the very beginning, the very first tweet was, see you humans now sleep, so many new conversations today, thank you, so many new beginnings. Now, <clears throat> Microsoft had to pull down the service after 24 hours because this bot has not only become racist, not only misogynic, not only anti-Semite, it became an openly Nazi Hitler-loving, uh, 
all due to the fact that people from Reddit and, and 4chan started doing conversations. And of course, there was a, an orchestrated effort to swamp the, the bot with uh, the most offensive and most rude and most terrible um, conversations one can find in the depth of the internet. But uh, yeah, these are the tweets, uh, tweets generated by the bot after just 24 hours of having conversations with humans. That speaks more to the nature uh, and the state of humankind than to the uh, to the prowess of Microsoft uh, engineers, but anyway, uh, you cannot really depend on the user-generated contents, especially when the users have an agenda uh, with respect to your your AI. But it doesn't have to be so malicious. Uh, here you have uh, the location of uh, Google's office in Berlin, and as you can see here is a terrible traffic jam. Uh, this is the street during the traffic jam, right? This gentleman here walking, he created the traffic jam. What he did, he, you see this small little trolley. This trolley was loaded with 100 active telephones, right? mobile phones. And he was just walking the streets with those phones. And uh, Google Maps was recording the location of all those phones and seeing that those phones are really slowly moving. So assuming that this is a uh, a terrible, terrible uh, congestion on the streets, it probably suggested everyone else to, to just go somewhere else and to direct the movement to nearby uh, streets, as you can see. So the guy had the street for himself. Um, this is an example of, of course, this is not malicious, this is benevolent, but still you can see how uh, a service which is very sophisticated, very complex, very large, involving hundreds and hundreds of very skilled engineers can be um, fooled by a guy with a small trolley and a couple of bucks to spend on, on phones or just asking his friends to borrow phones for, for 15 minutes, right? So yeah, this can happen as well. Um, the bias, uh, the bias can be algorithmic and uh, can can be created by humans. Uh, this is uh, another infamous example of the project Greenlight in Detroit. Uh, so here you see the locations of CCTV cameras across the city, and here is the distribution of ethnicities in the city of of Detroit. And it's really hard not to see a very very certain pattern. Uh, of placing those cameras. And of course, the placement of cameras, so the placement of sensors directly influences the selection of data, right? Because you will get the data that you get. In other, uh, in other words, if you see, for instance, if you try to use those cameras, for instance, for um, measuring or say those cameras can measure the speed of the car, um, they will learn that only people of, of, of specific ethnicity break the speed limits in the city. Uh, not because, well, the only reason will be that this, the, the, the model trained on this data will not see other faces, right? So, uh, and you can imagine that, <clears throat> that the data collected the, the 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 moment of data collection, or even worse, the model of the the, uh, the moment of model creation is postponed by several minutes, uh, several years uh, or months from the date of the selection of places where the cameras are, and then people take the location of cameras for granted and they don't question that. They just say, okay, we have the feed from the cameras. Great, so let's pull uh, the pictures and let's train our artificial intelligence models to do this and that and that. Right, but you have to go down many, many years to see where the cameras were located, why they were located where they were, and think about what what might cause uh, what what damage might be caused by such selection of of places. Uh, similarity bias again, uh, something that is present, very present in in con uh, contemporary uh, machine learning models. 
Um, this is something that leads to information bubbles, right? If you search Google News for an article and you and you give it some keywords, it will find articles and it will find other articles with similar headlines. And the headlines, given a very specific selection of keywords, they will mostly corroborate a given point of view because the same facts can be reported totally differently and with different keywords different speaking points depending on the political affiliation of a news source. So if you are just uh, using the recommender engine and you search by similarity saying, yeah, the person wants to read this, so let's, let's recommend more similar news, but similar in what sense? The similar in terms of the subject or the similar in, in terms of the form? If the latter, then probably it just enforces the information bubble because it will show people exactly the same points of view. YouTube has chosen a terrible objective, objective function uh, to optimize for the total length a person spends in the, uh, in the service, not on the number of videos being shown, not on the number of ads being shown, not at the quality of videos being shown, not even the similarity of videos descriptions. Right? They were just looking, they were optimizing the recommender system just to keep you as long as possible in the feed. And as a side result, and nobody programmed that, as a side result, this promoted a huge um, uh, amount of extreme content and, and all kinds of conspiracy theories being displayed in those uh, videos. Um, or some unforeseen consequences of aligning with stereotypes if job adverts are uh, presented to people and they uh, present, for instance, say medical technician versus a nurse and someone, a woman would or could, for instance, select the nurse just by self-aligning with a stereotype of a woman doing the, the job of a medical technician is a nurse. Right? So that is quite, uh, uh, quite a problem. Uh, Underrepresentation. Yeah, these are two uh, uh, extreme examples, but I just wanted to show. I was thinking whether I should show you those pictures or not because they are very offensive. But uh, yeah, this is this happens in 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 products produced by world leading um, uh, manufacturers. This is a Nikon camera, right? And yeah, it, it is supposed to be a helpful tool to suggest you to repeat the photo if someone has blinked, right? And they haven't tried, they haven't trained the algorithm for for uh, discovering people blinking on on the Asian people, right? And they are assuming that this is uh, uh, this person blinking. I mean, come on, it's really hard to be more offensive than than that. Or, or not to not to mention this one. Or this was so so famous that uh, you know, this is borderline criminal. Uh, care to guess what it is? These are the results of a Bing image search by if you just type in CEO into the Bing image search. This is what you will see. Uh, how many women do you see there? One. What percentage of American companies are being led by women? 28%. 28% of CEO positions in large companies are being currently held by women. So this result from Bing Images is really something to behold. Uh, but not only images, just let's play a little bit with text. I wanted to write something and yeah, uh, we'll go from Polish to English to French to Turkish and back to Polish. So I will write now in Polish the phrase, she is a famous actress. And in French, because French also has a grammar gender, it is une actrice célèbre, so this is feminine, right? Okay, <clears throat> so now we'll go to a language that doesn't have uh, a grammatical gender. Uh, a Turkish language is an example of such language, so we go into Turkish. So now I will translate, I will switch the translation 
from Turkish to Polish. And now it says, is a famous actor, but actor has already a masculine uh, masculine ending, so it took a masculine grammatical uh, gender. So let's go back to Polish, to French, and at un acteur célèbre. Before we had an une actrice célèbre, and now we have an un acteur célèbre. Right? So woman gets uh, lost on the way because a famous actor must be a man. Um, as a matter of fact, the problem is with the translation to Turkish, uh, where you drop the, the uh, gender, uh, you drop the gender, uh, grammatical gender. But then, if you go back, you have to either reconstruct it or to you should produce at least two different um, versions, right? And not not just one. Yeah. And to close my presentation, uh, after all this, let's play a little game. Are you the source of bias? Just look at those images and imagine that you are a human annotator who is responsible for providing labels for a machine learning machine, a machine learning algorithm, machine learning task to teach a machine to automatically label images. One of those three uh, descriptions is seriously wrong. Can you spot which one? I'll give you just a second to think about it. Or maybe someone wants to propose, wants to propose the label, which is clearly wrong. Uh, I don't, I don't see anyone, so uh, I will tell you which one. And of course, it is a black woman plays with her daughter. And the problem is that it is not a black woman. It is a woman. The adjective black has nothing to do with this image. The only reason why you would like to inform a machine learning model that she is black was to contrast her with someone else on this photo who would be, for instance, white. So a black woman talks to her white colleague. That would make sense because then the adjective would help the model to recognize between her given her skin complexion and the colleague who would have a lighter skin complexion. Uh, you don't see here a white man plays with a dog, right? Because you're assuming that he's a man. Yeah. So he is a man and her color, the color of her skin in this labeling of this image, of this action, what she does with the kid has absolutely nothing to do with, with, uh, with the action, right? And this is very, very hard to spot, especially if you're not a person of color. To spot that this, uh, this adjective is not only superfluous, it is, it is wrong because it teaches something, the model, that it should not teach. Like this adjective uh, serves some purpose and it serves no purpose in this, in this label. So it's really much, much harder than one would, one would think. Okay, thank you very much.